Uh, I'm sure I have. I mean, everything on my website, to the best of my knowledge, I have permission to use of my music. I don't have anybody else's music there, and I've never, I've, I've just about always asked performers, I think I've always asked them, but if I've missed any, you know, no one's ever complained to me saying, take that down right now. Well, you know, the only thing I, I, I did violate unknowingly on my blog years ago, it was like five years ago, I was walking around in the, in the woods and hills of San Juan Island with a friend of mine who lived in the neighborhood, and we came across this really cool boat on this hillside that some guy was clearly restoring, but he was restoring it to be living in it. It was this magical looking vessel, like a Viking boat. It was clearly not going to be seaworthy. It was just this really cool thing. And I took a picture of it, and I thought that was harmless. And, I, and, and, and when you see my blog, you'll see there are very few man-made objects on it. It really is all nature, but this boat was really cool. So I put it up with something very charming, nothing disparaging, just something very sweet about coming across this. I got the most livid um, phone call or email or something from the guy who owned the boat. And apparently, I guess because he was in trouble with um, the property uh, rights thing, and uh, I don't know, he was in violation with that boat or something. So he was freaking out, totally freaking out, that I had made it public, even though, of course, I didn't say, I didn't even know his name. I didn't say his name, didn't say the address, didn't say what mountain I was on. But still, I took it down immediately. I said, don't worry, I'll take it down. It's the only time I've had a complaint. And I felt so awful, you know, it's like, geez, it's just a boat on a hill. But, you know, you never know, right? You never know what can... But you were going to... Were you asking a question for no, a reason? I was just, no, I was just curious, because, I mean, like, I sort of feel like, like, I've personally set texts before that are, like, oh. copyrighted, oh. but then have asked after I've set oh, them. Oh, bad idea. We bad have, idea. Well, yeah, let's talk about text. I'm really glad you brought that up, because that's one of the things I was going to get to next regarding permission. It is not just a good idea or suggested, it is vital, vital that any time before you write a note of music to your most beloved poem, prose, limerick, whatever, that you get permission. If you don't, you cannot ever, ever, ever have that piece performed. Uh, and that would be heartbreaking after all the time you spend writing it. So you absolutely have to get text permission, it's called. And you do this usually by contacting the publisher of the text. The publisher grants the permission. At, on ASCAP's site, and again, BMI might have something too, but I, I'm not as familiar with them. ASCAP has a whole thing on text permission up there. If you click, go over to the concert music section of ASCAP, <coughs> and you'll find it, you know, resources for composers or something like that, and read it and study it. How many of you are writing to text, setting text? Okay. Promise me you will never, because there are heartbreaking cases of various, even composers who should know better. Heartbreaking cases of how they had to throw everything out or reset text to the music somehow, but totally different text, and we all know how challenging that would be. Um, you cannot use anybody's text without permission any more than they can use your music without your permission. In other words, if I'm a poet and uh, I've decided I've written this lovely poem, it's all mine, and you know what, your piece, I've been listening to it over and over again, it actually goes really well with my words, so I'm going to just do this. And then I'm going to send you a note with my recording of your music. And I'm going to tell you how great it is and, and, and thanks. And guess what? You're going to hear the music and you're going to hit the ceiling. And, or, or you're going to read the words, which are like all about some, you know, pornographic gorillas and orangutans. <laughs> and you're going to say, I really don't want my music set to pornographic gorillas and orangutans. Thank you very much. And then you're going to deny permission. No, I think that was the original text, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's really important um, that you can never assume that a poet or any writer would want music to be set. There are a number of instances. I think E.E. E. Cummings and some others, or T.S. Eliot, with, or they're so both very different there, there are some, there are some uh, the, not these two that I just mentioned, but there are some writers who have specified that they don't want their uh, words set to music at all. Because, they, again, their art is as precious to them as ours is to us. And just like you may have written a beautiful symphony that to you absolutely stands alone, and as it probably should, as a symphony, and you couldn't imagine having a singer wreck it with, you know, with some words. Well, uh, you know, text writers feel the same way. So you have to respect the text writers. Always get permission. And again, you will, you will really shoot yourself in the foot, because I know a lot of people who have um, not, who are hoping that it's easier to ask uh, Forgiveness than permission, is that the line? And they were wrong. <laughs> and, and so premieres have been canceled and all kinds of things. It's very sad. 
I just think it's heartbreaking to think you know, how much time we slave over our works, right? To imagine writing an opera or writing, which some people, it has happened. People have written operas without permission. Or a big choral work or something, and then, eh, no go. So, um, okay. We've talked about, um, we talked about, we've covered a lot of ground, actually, even on bouncing around. Um, one of the things that's fun to talk about, now some of you are performers, so you know this, but for, for those of you who aren't, I'm, a little bit about rehearsal etiquette and audience etiquette, I think is worth just going over. Because again, just as we are now in a multimedia world with our music, where as I said earlier in the day, it's not just about the music a lot of the times, now that it's visuals, we have to think about the things on a screen for people to be you know, thrilled by, um, because this is the world we're in. Well, it's the same thing that, unlike the old days, where composers would just um, be hidden off in a hovel someplace, and really nobody saw them, nobody talked to them, there, there was uh, no new music box interviewing them, and they certainly didn't have to go to the lip of the stage to introduce their piece. Gone are those days, and I'm sure all of you have already gone to the lip of the stage many times to talk to the audience, and for some of you, it's a ridiculously terrifying experience, and others might be hopefully comfortable with it. But it's so important. You are the only ambassador for your music, right? It's so important to be able to be comfortable talking to audiences, because we are now asked to do this a lot. And, and sometimes you're, you're asked to do it in a way where you really can't say no, even though you'd rather call under a rock. You know, you really have to learn to be comfortable with it. You have to learn to be comfortable also how to be gracious in acknowledging the players on stage, being acknowledging the audience with the proper, you know, battle of or whatever. You know, just the, the gracious ways of being when you're being applauded. You know, it sounds hokey to be talking about this, but it's actually a very big part of our job description. If you are going to be around where when your uh, things are performed, you have to be comfortable in how you address people and how you acknowledge them. You know, we, it's and going and working backwards with in rehearsals. Not so, not so much with small ensembles. That's a more intimate thing, and it's easier to rehearse with small ensembles. And there's no conductor, and so they are hoping for your input. And there's an appropriate time to give it and not. I mean, you don't want to necessarily stop them when they're right in the middle of everything. You know, if things aren't even going that well, make notes, right, while they're plowing away, and then give them notes afterwards. You don't necessarily have to in interrupt them as they're as they're trying to get make their way through your new piece. But there are definitely some protocol rules, in a sense, of uh, orchestral and band uh, things. And some of you know them, but some of you may not. That it's you don't have a direct line to God with the orchestra. You know, God is the conductor, and so you gotta. You, if you, you're when you have something to say, you listen. To the, the conductor is going to run the rehearsal, and then hopefully will remember that you're actually there in the room behind him or her, and will invite you up to the stage to make comments. The first comments that you make are to the conductor. You don't just immediately, other than, thanks, that was great. You know, I, I tried to say something really encouraging to the band or whoever. But I will turn to the conductor and I'll say, I have a few notes. Would you like me to give them to you? Or would you like me to speak directly to, um, to, the, to, the, or to the band or orchestra? And give them that option because it, it will go both ways. Sometimes they're going to want them just themselves and they'll give them. And other times, more often than not in the band world, they do want the composer talking directly to the band, and I, I do that a lot. But that's not always the case. And never ever rush the stage and come up uh, and start talking before you are invited to do so. That's conductors have you know they've got a tight clock obviously, and they have a certain way of running their rehearsals. Some are warm and fuzzy and won't bother be bothered at all. But many of them will find this very offensive. You know they it's their room and you're a guest in it even though it's your music. So just be aware of that protocol when you're dealing with um, up at the podium, when you go up to the podium. Um, I, again, I, I'm in this very warm and fuzzy band world, so people are, they always want me to talk a lot, and that's great. But, um, I mean, it's great for me. I don't know how it is for them. <laughs> but, uh, I never, but I never assume it. And the same thing for acknowledgments. Um, we always assume and hope that, if, that the ensemble or band or conductor or whomever will know that we're in the audience. We hope that they will know that we're in the audience and that they will do this the standard, you know, <laughs> right? 
and then they out into the dark, because of course they've got lights in their eyes, so they can't even see where we are anyway. And they do this, and then you <coughs> trot up to the stage, oh so chipperly, um, but not before. And things that look really silly, I'm just gonna tell you, it's a doofus move to run up to the stage if you have not been acknowledged, because it either, you know, it just looks bad, because it, it ends up being embarrassing for everybody involved. It, you're sort of embarrassing the conductor who, or the ensemble who forgot you were there, and you're, so, and you're looking way too over, over um, uh, eager. You know, it's just, you know, not everybody has to be acknowledged all the time. Uh, and the same thing is, you want to also notice whether are people who are being acknowledged simply standing up um, and sitting down again in their seats, or are they going up to the stage? A lot of the times, you are at, you, they like it if you come up to the stage, but I think you have to feel that situation out. Um, it, it just it depends, if it's, especially if it's a premiere or something, or a particularly hard piece, I think it's very appropriate to come up to the stage and quickly, especially if you're only in the middle of the program and not the end, quickly you know, thank everybody, if it's a small ensemble, or thank the concertmaster and the conductor, or whatever, um, if invited to do so. But sometimes it's just very appropriate to simply stand up, acknowledge, you know, do a little turn thing, you know, acknowledge everybody around you. If there's a balcony, whatever, you're out of luck um, if you're under it. But you know, just and then sit back down again. Know when to sit down. Um, there is, I think, some people are guilty of, of a bit too much ego, where they're always rushing the stage and thank you and just come on, get over yourself. Just you know, the next. <laughs> Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a doofus move. We see it and we go, and you kind of cringe for the person who's rushing the stage and something a little too too anxious. So, now, having said that, I'm ha I go to the stage, you know, whenever, and if, if invited, but again, I don't, I don't do it if, if it's not clear to me that somebody wants me to take that out. Uh, just helpful hints from Heloise, as we say. Your mileage may vary. Um, Questions do you have, guys? Guys in New York? I call everybody guy, by the way. I'm from New York. Oh, oh she's just in she. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about your composing process and how you go about making music? Oh, wow, that's like a whole seminar. Um, yeah, but I, I, I'd be happy to do that. But, you know, if you guys have more business questions of, you know, of what you need to get out there and conquer the world as composers, I'm very happy to answer, answer that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, but with, so, the whole getting permission, like your text or, or really anything, um, did you find it hard and do, do you maybe have tips to sort of get those bigger companies to pay attention to you when you're sort of just starting out? Oh, it, you know, that's a great question. And un unfortunately, the real expert on that question um, is, because of medical issues, not able to be here, which is Stephen Paulus, who's an expert. At, and he's a co-founder of the uh, whole ASCAP concert uh, career, concert music, com composer career workshop, I can't even say it. And, uh, and he has written so many operas and has such a, a great handle on how to how to do this, and I wish he were here to address that. Um, always, you know, a gracious letter. And you don't have to say, I'm just starting out. You know, don't be, don't put yourself down before you start. Just say, I am a composer in Bellingham, Washington, and very, and, and adore such and such as work, and I have a performance opportunity at such and such a date with such and such a venue and such and such an ensemble. Uh, and it would give me tremendous joy to be able to set the words of yada 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 uh, to my music for 13 ocarinas. <laughs> now, that's the part that might give you a guaranteed no, or can give you a guaranteed yes, I don't know. But um, uh, that is, uh, that's a very good um, question. Is there a, a, a surefire way to reach out? If you don't know anybody in the publishing company, they get requests all the time. Uh, I don't know is the question, but that doesn't mean that other people who have more experience in it wouldn't know, wouldn't have some good ideas for you. <coughs> so, try, you know, it, it, I, I always believe that you can try more than once, because usually these companies have more than one person in them. So you could try, if you're looking for permission, send that kind of a letter out and see what kind of response you get. It might take a while to get the response, by the way. They don't return these right away. Um, and if you don't hear back, you know, try again, you know, maybe try, try talking to somebody. And, or, or call up somebody and ask, have a BMI and ask, 
or somebody that you know, uh, a, a professor or somebody who is you know, more plugged in, uh, who might have a good idea on how to do that. So, so as, as for my, my work, um, as, as you asked, the composing process usually begins with, oh my god, what am I going to write? It kind of, it kind of goes like that for quite a while. <laughs> Pretty much like all of you, I would imagine. <laughs> I'm always on deadline for stuff. I always have a bunch of commissions lined up, and I space them out, and I back time. I think you have to be here's good advice. Be really good at back timing. Um, you're going to have sometimes. You know you're always going to meet the deadline, but you never know how long it's going to take you to come up with the material that you really love. And sometimes you're going to throw out a bunch of starts before you really hit on the one that's the one you're going to stick with. Um, Sometimes we get lucky and the whole piece seems to write itself very quickly. Other times it's like pulling teeth. And you just have to have faith that the good ideas are going to show up. But what you also have to do to accommodate all that uncertainty is to give yourself more time than you even think you're going to need. And also plan for unexpected life things. Everything from having a cold to having a, some kind of crisis, you know something, or having the internet go out for a week, or some weird thing that can happen that will set you back. And if you give yourself enough time to incorporate all those weird things that could possibly happen, you won't be too stressed as you, as you keep doing this, because it is a lot to juggle. It, you know, once you're up and running and working all the time at this, you're juggling a lot of pieces at once. And I think an insight into the life of a working composer from my perspective is that and a, a self-published composer, is that if the amount of um, plate spinning is, is remarkable. Like, like even just you know, any given week, even though I might be wanting to stay in the sound zone of one piece that I'm working on, which is the case right now, um, and it, it's a piece that's not coming that easily, but I know, I can, I know what I want to say, but I'm not finding it quite yet. Um, and it will come. But while I'm in that sound zone and cordoning off a big chunks of time to do that writing, I had a master mix for Kettle Brew, Austin, the one piece for, for percussion and, and electronics that... Which is an awesome piece, I recommend. Thank you. Check it, check it out. Check it out. <laughs> I'm going I'm to put the whole thing up on stream, Dave, and I, Dave Jarvis and I just talked about. Dave Jarvis is the percussion um, uh, faculty of um, um, Washington State University, where I was in residence right either before or right after here, yeah. I forget. It was right after. Right after, uh, which is where Austin and I met. And um, he's an incredible percussionist and also a fine composer. And when they commissioned me for a piece, I turned around and it was going to be a timpani piece. I said, how about you co-compose it with me? And he was like, wow, really? I said, yeah. And it was a really great process of, of <coughs> back and forth um, and a truly a collaborative effort. Uh, but anyway, so I was dealing with the master of that. I was dealing with getting, with my, um, I've got a score prep person. I do all my own copying in Sibelius. But now with my large band pieces, especially now that they're out with Hal Leonard, I have a score preparation guy <coughs> in the Chicago area who's terrific. Uh, John Blaine is his name. He's just great. And, um, and so I was dealing with a very complicated set of score adjustments and prep adjustments on a piece that has to get out. And I'm about to be speaking at, at the Midwest Clinic in Chicago, which is this really big band and orchestra clinic, about 15,000 people go to this thing. And I'm, I'm a clinician there, and I've got a piece being performed there. And so I'm dealing with my herd of fellow panelists, because I'm a lead clinician. All in, all, this is all in one day. And I'm trying to write this music. And by the way, you know, I sold two scores, that, and those orders have to go out the door. And that's just like half of it. But those are the things that I'm remembering, all of which were totally different styles of music, different parts of my brain, different people, different parts of the world, everything. That's typical. That's a typical day, you know, in, in terms of the process of of working as a composer is you, you want to just be doing one thing a lot of the time, but real life means to keep all this plate spinning, you have to be able to you know turn one thing off and turn one thing on. But one thing I try not to do um, is multitask. In turn, that is multitasking in a serial way. You know, I'll have a day filled with a number of different things that have to be dealt with, and I do try to wait until a certain time before I address deal with the outside world stuff. Um, but I have found, maybe it's an age thing, but I have found that trying to do them literally simultaneously uh, is, is not helpful. And it's, we're already so fragmented with all of the online stuff going on all the time, and the Facebooking, and the texting, and the tweeting, and the tweeting, and all that stuff. And it's just a bit overwhelming to the brain process. And I think that being a composer 
is so much about being in the moment with yourself and your own thoughts. And we do need silence and stillness, I think, to hear and to imagine the sounds that we want to hear. Because that's what we are. We're sound inventors. And we, we, in order to do that, lying down, Liliano taught me this, the first thing to do, lie down. Lie down and close your eyes. Try not to fall asleep. But close your eyes and imagine what it is that you are trying to create sound-wise. What world are you trying to take people into? I always think of composing as taking a, a totally innocent audience, uh, holding them hostage <laughs> for X amount of minutes, and taking them on a journey. And I feel like it's my responsibility, since they paid their 30 bucks or whatever, and they're probably not going to stand up and walk out. Unlike art, where they walk right by in a museum if they don't like it. But with our music, they're kind of stuck there. You don't see people walking out that much. And so I feel like we've got a responsibility to take them on a journey someplace, an interesting journey. Same thing with the musicians who are going to be practicing this piece over and over again. I want it to be fun for them. I don't want it to be a drag for them to play my music. And so um, all of that goes into the, the, the thinking about, about a piece. All of that happens, and that stillness has to happen amidst the hubbub of running a life as a composer with all these different ensembles and people and you know, stuff that has and mixes and things flying at me that have to be dealt with, you know, on the fly. And I try to try to triage it, and I try to say probably much to the chagrin of a couple of people who would prefer to have immediate responses to things. I say to myself, you know, the world is not going to stop spinning on its axis if I do not answer this email right now and if I wait six hours you know, to answer. And I, I've started to get, um, or a day or two, depending on it, I've started to try to protect my time. One thing I can say to you guys is no one is going to give you your time except for you. No matter what you do in life, life is always going to get filled up with lots of stuff. If you have a family, my God, you've got kids running around, you've got a, a partner, you've got people in your life that need a lot of attention. Um, you know, the cat's puking on the rug, you gotta deal with that, right? You know, it's like, this is life. And you, no one's gonna give you your writing time. So you have to card it out for yourself. No matter what, what stage of your career you're in, you have to hold that time really precious. You jealously guard that time. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's hard to do all the time. I have found that certainly it's not as hard as it seems to turn off the work computer. My rig is that I've got, I can show you a picture if you want, I've got a, a um, set up in the living room, which is my music room, and then I've got at a angle, a right angle, um, that little laptop with a big, you know, 24, 27 inch screen for business stuff. And so, you know, sometimes I'm running everything simultaneously, and that can be good. You know, I'll be composing, and once in a while, I look over my shoulder to see just what what's crashing and burning in the business world there that I have to deal with. But just as often, I just turn that off. You know, I turn that one off, and I make myself just focus in on my sound world, it's okay to turn the, the outside world off. And that's what residencies are for. You know, for instance, like I, I was at the McDowell Colony a few years ago, and that's actually what led to me deciding to move to San Juan Island. Not that New Hampshire is anything like San Juan Island, but it was the sense of, gee, if I'm so happy living in a, ca and productive, you know, living in this little cabin in the woods in, in uh, Peterborough, New Hampshire, the McDowell Colony is the nation's oldest arts colony. It's just a great place. And if I'm so happy doing that, why shouldn't my life look like that all the time? And at the time, I was living in, in LA. I was in Malibu, which is a beautiful part of LA to live in. But still, the traffic was insane. Still is. You know, it was, a, it was not an easy place to live. And I finally <coughs> decided, I don't have to live here anymore. I've got the net. You know, my stuff is out there enough. I can live anywhere I want because I'm not a performer. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, that's a bad thing to be a performer. But the good thing is it gave me a lot more freedom to decide to live up here and not feel like I had to be in the middle of, uh, of a big city for gigging. And so it was the McDowell Colony and that positive uh, experience that I had that gave me the thought of, gee, I, I can live anywhere. Why am I living in a big city uh, with all of its craziness if I'm so happy in, in a very rural area? And now my life is extremely rural. Uh, so that's, that's a cool thing that can come out of it. And I guess the last thing I want to encourage you guys and say, also from a personal life story, is that always take risks. With, push your comfort zone as artists, because it'll be amazing to you what happens. As I, as I say, it's not brain surgery, no one's going to die. What's the, the worst thing that can happen if you accept a gig for something that you feel totally unprepared about and don't know what you're doing 
hopefully you're going to rise to the occasion, and you probably will, and do spectacularly at it, and have learned a great deal about how to do that. And, it, and even if it didn't turn out that well, it's only a piece of music, you know? It's not gonna, your world is not going to come crashing to an end. You have many pieces of music. My point, case in point is five, only five years ago, in 2008, I was contacted out of the blue by a commander with the U.S. Army who was, who was the major of, of one of the big orchestras there. I mean, bands are there. And, he, and this was back in the days of MySpace. This is five years ago. And, um, and, he, and he contacted me through MySpace to commission me. And at first I thought this was a joke from a friend. I mean, I really did. I couldn't believe this. And you know, the U.S. government is trolling for artists on MySpace. Cool. And well, it turned out to be very true. And he was very gracious. And I looked at this. And I, I was terrified. I, I, I was very honest with him. I wrote back. And I said, because he had heard my books and he liked what he heard of my music. And I said, I have to be honest with you. Not only have I never written for Wind Band before, I have never even been to a band concert. Like, I had never heard a band in, in any real way. Um, you know, I, I guess I could hum the Washington March or something, you know, but uh, I was thinking, you gotta be kidding me. I don't know my ass from my elbow when it comes to band music. And he wrote back, basically, I didn't quite use that phrase, but close. And he wrote back, and he said, that's, it. He said, that's why we want you, because you don't know, think about this, because you don't know band music, because you're going to write something that's different. And what I can hear from your music is you do write stuff that's different, and we want something that's different. And it got even better than that. I, I accepted the commission. It was great. And um, I speak, remember what I said before about pricing yourself? I had no idea even what to charge. I called up. I, I did some due diligence. I found out who they had recently commissioned. It turns out to be someone I'd never met, but we knew each other in name. And I felt comfortable enough contacting her. And I said, you know, I explained, I just got this. By the way, can you give me a ballpark? what you charge. She said yes, she told me. I tacked on another thousand bucks to the price and, uh, and I got the commission and, they, you know, and that was awesome. So here's the, the moral of the story is I then I contacted the major like the next week as I was getting going or getting ready to get going on the piece and I kind of said okay what band pieces should I be listening to? I want to study up. Yeah. And he was like no don't listen to band music. Do not listen to band music. Do not, because he said all those guys, mostly guys, mo all those all those composers are, you know, totally inside the lines with their standard voicings, right, and their standard way of doing things. And he said, we're so, we've got enough of that. He said, whatever you do, Alice, we know it's going to be different. And I'm thinking, yeah, you're not going to end up in Guantanamo in an orange jumpsuit. It's going to be that different. Um, but anyway, knowing nothing about, I mean, I know a reasonable amount, amount about instruments and writing music, but knowing nothing about bands and balances and euphoniums, I'd never written for a euphonium before, you know, I, I did it. And you know what? It worked. It, made, it, it really worked. And it was because he was so encouraging, and he was encouraging me with the power of the word, yes, go do it. And he encouraged me to say that to myself. And I'm encouraging you guys to say it to yourselves, that giving yourselves the power of the word yes and taking risks and doing things that are out of your comfort zone are going to lead to huge things for you. Uh, my, the, the biggest part of my career right now is band music. I feel like the bell of the ball at the Midwest Clinic and now the Texas Music Educators Association where I'm also doing a clinic in electroacoustic band music, which also was a new field that I kind of, you know, I put my, it's like chocolate and peanut butter together. <laughs> I, I love electronics and I like music and I really enjoy the power of the band sound. Put them all together, you've got something really powerful. Um, and I recommend it. But so I created my own world out of whole cloth. Having never five years ago even written for band, now I'm doing all this electroacoustic band stuff that very few people are, are doing and I get to, you know, get a lot of attention for it, and that makes me feel good for the field, because it, it tells me that the field is hungry for new music, it's hungry for composers, it really supports the band directors who love composers and new music, They're, they need repertoire. Um, same thing for the choral field, by the way. Choral music, I mean, now we're getting down to brass tacks about how to make a better, better income as a composer. The band and the choral worlds are the two best, fastest ways for you to get your music out there in a big way. I'm going to say that right now. Now, this is someone who's got like a hundred chamber music pieces in her catalog, but and I love chamber music and I still write it and I still am commissioned for it and I have lots of chamber music stuff going on. But the band world and the choral world sell very large numbers of pieces. 
it gets so the word of mouth gets out there unbelievably between you know with conductors and bands and band band players and players themselves. Some of those players grow up to become band directors, which is really neat. You know, so they they are coming up right with you. I want to encourage you guys to think about writing in those two fields in addition to other things that you're writing, whatever. Uh, also moves your passions. But consider branching out into band and choral because those are two areas where you will always find commissions. Okay? I can't guarantee that with orchestras <laughs> and the orchestra world right now is a bit topsy-turvy, although plenty of great regional orchestras are out there looking for stuff. But the orchestral world has hundreds of years of repertoire and they don't necessarily feel like they need a whole lot more and you know we can tell it by the programming. You know, it's much harder to find new pieces consistently through an orchestral uh, program. Whereas you go to band concerts and like half the stuff is new. It's great. They love new music and they need it. We're building their repertoire. <coughs> Same thing with choral music. Lots of new choral music coming out. Um, Seattle, as you know, has some terrific choral uh, groups. There's, um, there's Pro Musica. Karen Thomas has Seattle Pro Musica. Eric Banks has the Esoterics. Uh, there's some others that I'm liking on, but you know, there's there's a lot of stuff going on in the area. Bellingham, I'm sure, has stuff that you guys know about that I don't. Um, those are very powerfully positive opportunities for you to pursue that will result in a lot of performances for you and a niche that you can build for yourselves. And a niche that you can build for yourself sounding like you, not having to ever think that you have to sound like anybody else who has already written a lot of groovy music. You know, Morton Lawrenson is a really outrageously genius, fantastic composer. He's also an outrageously wonderful friend of mine. And I can't tell you how much I admire his music. But that doesn't mean I have to try to sound like him, right? As much as I admire it, and as, as incredible as he is, um, I, all of that is the same for you. You are each, like I said in the beginning, it's a nice way to bookend the talk. Each one of you has something very special to say that's just you. It's just you and your heart. And it cannot be duplicated. It cannot be digitized. The music might get shared and pirated all over, but you cannot be shared. You are a one-off. <laughs> and by making yourself part of a community, you make yourself very valuable because you are the only you. Sounds. I sound like Sesame Street when I <laughs> say that. You are the only you. But it's... <laughs> But it's true, and your value as a composer, each one of you, is for what notes you're going to put together that none of us in the room would have ever thought of putting together. And that's true for every single one of us. We put notes together very differently, and in that we rejoice. And with that, that's been my Sunday sermon, <laughs> The Church of Abundance. <laughs> Thanks, guys. is alex at alexshapiro.org, not com. You'll get some weird guy if you go to the dot com thing. I have <laughs> stories about that. Um, but anyway, dot org. And feel free to email me with any questions. Um, you know, or Facebook friend, like John. <laughs> <laughs>